So we would actually, I think we will be probably debt free before June uh, with everything extra that we have coming in. Question. Why can't your family come visit you guys in California? Oh, uh, well, my parents don't have a visa. Uh, mm-hmm. And unfortunately, uh, like I said, you know, we're trying to break that cycle. My parents don't have a lot of money. They're like, pregnant neither do you. Getting by. Yeah. And my. Um, no, no. You don't have a lot of money either. Well, that's true. <laughs> I want you to I want you to sit with that for a minute, because it's very easy mm-hmm. to look at somebody else and go, well, I understand why they can't spend the money but not allow that same rhetoric to work for yourself. You don't have a lot of money either. You got $44,000 in debt and good on you for realizing, okay, we need to do something to change that. I'm just going to be honest with you. If it were me, I would wait. I would wait until I can take this trip and do this trip the way I want to do this trip to where it's a blessing. It's not a burden. It's not setting us back. You know, I hear what you're saying and the cause is noble. You, you don't want to repeat that cycle. And making the decision to take a trip that you can't afford is part of repeating that cycle. You've got to learn when it's okay to say no, when it's okay to say yes, and how to prioritize um, the habits that are going to help you break that cycle. What do you got, George? Well, I'm wondering, by the time you take this trip, let's say you went in December, January, how old will the baby be? Uh, Baby would be a year and a half. Now let's say you waited until you were completely debt free and then saved up and paid for this trip in cash. How old would the baby be by the time you went on that trip? I would say around two or more. So the question is, we're talking about the baby's a year and a half versus two years old, but we're in a completely different place financially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I don't, I don't see this as an emergency of we have to go before the baby turns 18 months yeah. or else it's not going to – it's going to be special. Not with cameras no the way they are. No matter how the baby is. Not with cameras the way they are and the internets the way the internets Let's are. Let's FaceTime once a week with the baby and the grandparents until we do this thing. But I'm with Jade on making this a blessing instead of a curse because you said the reason you're doing this is because you want to change your family tree and break these generational curses. And part of that is sacrifice and doing mm-hmm. things that are weird, things that are uncomfortable things you're not happy about right now, but that will cause you to have long-term success in the future. That's where it's at. Hey, we appreciate that call, Christina. Like George and I said, just this is part of the sacrifice to win. You feel it. And trust me, uh, little Junior, he's going to appreciate the sacrifices that his parents uh, made to win when he's old enough and able to talk and able to say what he feels about it. All right, let's take another call. We got Sean from Seattle, Washington. What's going on in your world, Sean? Hey, how you guys doing? We're doing good. How are you? Doing all right. I just had a general like house question related to net worth. Mm-hmm. I know the Ramsey parameters about fifteen year fixed on you know less than twenty five percent of your take home. But one thing that I've never really heard of is how much is too much when the house becomes like a part of your net worth. Are, are there like kind of safety nets around that, or love to get some clarity? So you're feeling like too you, too much of your net worth is tied up in your personal residence? Yeah. Do I'm, you need to tap into this money soon? No. Oh. I mean, when I look at, okay, so Dave wrote a book, Baby Steps Millionaires, and he talks about how generally it breaks down to where a third of your net worth is in your home and two thirds of it is in your retirement accounts. So that's kind of what's normal. Um if you don't, I mean, how old are you? 35. What's your, what's your concern here? Are you concerned that over time you're not going to be able to invest and kind of balance that out? No, I, I, I just am trying to find a healthy balance because the market I live in is ridiculous. Yeah. So if I'm moving to a bigger home in the future, I just want to make sure that it fits within my numbers. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm not trying to pull anything out and I'm, I'm trying to get the baby step seven at the end of the day. But again, just the ratios, I'm, I'm not too familiar. Well, I'll tell problem. you, Sean, my situation, because I don't fall into the mold that we found in Baby Steps Millionaires. I'm the opposite. We were super aggressive with paying off our house because it creates cash flow while we continue to live for the next, you know, 20, 30 years until we retire. And so over time, you know, my two thirds of my net worth is in my house. A third is in our retirement accounts. Over time, that's going to shift. I might have two, three, four million dollars in retirement accounts by the time we retire. And my house is probably not going to be worth four million dollars at that point. 
And so it's not really about having an equal ratio. If you talk to a financial planner, they would probably say, hey, we want it to have more equal footing versus having way too much in house and you can't live on retirement. So your house isn't going to create an income for you, whereas your retirement account will. So the goal is really to say, hey, 20, 30 years from now, when I need to tap into that retirement account, is there enough for me to where I don't have to work anymore and I can choose to work? And so I would think of it more in terms of your goals versus hitting a magical parameter. But it's a great question. Interesting great conversation. Question. Yeah. And you've got time. You've got plenty of time to be investing 15%. And for those of you who are new to this conversation, net worth is what you own minus what you owe. And that's the only way to become a millionaire is by calculating your net worth. It's not about uh, how much income you make, right? Your income doesn't make you a millionaire. You don't need to make a million dollars. You can make $40,000 and still become a millionaire. That's right. This is The Ramsey Show. Y'all, there's a lot you can't control when it comes to healthcare, but there is something you should check out that can help. Christian Healthcare Ministries. CHM is not insurance. It is budget-friendly, biblically-based health cost sharing. That means a community of members helping share the burden of each other's healthcare costs. They help people just like you in all 50 states. So see if CHM could be right for your family. Learn more today at chministries.org slash budget. Listening to the Ramsey Show. I'm your host, Jade Warshaw. I am joined by my good buddy, George Camel. Thank uh, you for saying that. You know, John you know always says we're not friends, even though we're actually BFFs. Well, you know, John doesn't have any friends. Ooh. We're best friends. Shots fired, <laughs> John Deloney. If you're listening, I know you're feet away listening. Well, We've we got, we all ahead. actually like each other, Jade. Can we just we put do. that out there? Oh, we have yes. a great time. We do. And yes. if you want to be with us all in the same room, which is actually pretty rare, you need to join us for our Smart Conference event next month. It's an entire weekend of good times, and we're almost out of tickets. This thing is selling out. Wow. It's at our brand new Ramsey Event Center just up the hill here from our headquarters. And in addition to giving you life-changing, practical, and proven wisdom to help you be successful in every area of life, we're going to celebrate like crazy. It's a good time. It's high energy, live music. April 14th and 15th, join myself, Dave Ramsey, Rachel Cruz, Dr. John Deloney, Ken Coleman, Christina Ellis, and Jade Warshaw for an amazing weekend. We're going to talk about how to crush debt, find work that you love, improve your overall wellness, build wealth, all of it. So we'd love to meet you and hear your story and uh, maybe grab a photo, sign a book or two. And don't forget, because this is the first event at the new Ramsey Event Center, every ticket includes a special commemorative badge. That's exciting. I hope I can get one. So general admission tickets are just 119 bucks each, but they're almost gone. You don't want to miss this weekend event. Go to RamseySolutions.com slash events and grab yours today. And Jade, it's going to be your first time speaking at Smart Conference, Yes, right? it is going to be my first time. I'm already preparing, George. I hope so. It's I'm coming up. I'm getting my ducks in a row. You better be preparing by now. <laughs> this thing's coming up. I know. I'm excited. I can't wait to see you guys there. Uh, in the meantime, let's go ahead and take some calls, George. We got Eric's in Phoenix. Phoenix. Arizona. What's going on out there Phoenix? in Phoenix, Eric? Hey, I'm a long-time listener, first-time caller. I've been listening to Dave since the early 2000s. Wow. Good deal. Good question deal. About, quick question about my 401k and my Roth 401k contributions. What's going on? Um, I, am debt free, I am debt-free except for my house and putting 15% away into retirement accounts. Mm-hmm. My question is, according to what I read, my Roth 401k... I can put up a total contribution of 22500 into my Roth. Right. And my, co- my company will match me a certain percentage of that. So Great. the question I have is, Dave has always said, hey, put up to your company match in your 401k, then go outside and match out your Roth, and then go back into your 401k to get to your 15%. My question is, should I put my total 15% 
into my Roth 401k instead of going outside of my Roth. That's an option. And that's actually what me and my wife have done because it's a Roth option. So uh, that advice, the match beats Roth beats traditional is what you're talking about. And because you have Roth options in the 401k, you don't have to deal with any traditional options. And so if you go beyond the 15% with your employer, you could then uh, put some into that Roth IRA if, if your income would exceed that. Now, there are income limits with the Roth IRA. There are not income limits with the Roth 401k. Right. That's what is your, what what's your income? I just wanted to make sure. About 140000 Okay. So you'd probably get, is that, are you going to hit the max limit this year? Yes. That's exciting. That's so anything beyond that, um, I think with 140, look into it, what the uh, limits are for this year, you mm-hmm. may still be able to contribute to a Roth IRA. I'm not sure about that. Okay. But if not, you could still that. contribute I'll... to the traditional IRA to finish out that 15%. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you very much. You got it, man. Awesome. Thanks for your call. I appreciate that. I think a lot of people wonder about that. You know, they, they're not sure how to invest their money. So the rule generally would be match beats Roth beats traditional. But in his case, he had the match in the same place that he had his Roth benefit through his uh, 401k. Yeah, so, so. If, if you don't have a Roth 401k option, you just have traditional through your employer, we would say get the match if there is one, then go fully fund a Roth IRA outside of your employer, and then you can go back to your traditional 401k and finish out the 15%. But if you've got the Roth 401k, you're, you're sitting the, pretty. the point here is to get the tax advantage uh, growth. Now, what about, George, if you exceed the limits for doing a, a Roth IRA? What would you say to those folks? So that would be if you, have a, if you have a real high income and you are above those limits, you still have other options. Number one, an HSA is a great place to sock away money for retirement. Ooh, it can actually become a retirement HSA. account. So if you max that out, number one, you get the tax benefit. Mm-hmm. Uh, it'll be deducted. And when you're, I believe, 65, it kind of becomes like a traditional 401k account. That's right. It does. I and, love that. Uh, and of course, you can use that money towards qualified medical expenses and get the full tax benefit there. So that's an option. There's also a taxable brokerage account outside of retirement, uh, which means you're not getting any real tax benefits, but that money's going to get the power of compound interest. Yep. I love it. Very, very cool. Let's take another call. Let's see what Thomas is talking about in Kansas City. What's going on, Thomas? How can we help today? Hey, how y'all doing? Doing good. Um, yeah, so my wife and I, we don't have any debt except for our house. Um, we, uh, I'm kind of a spreadsheet nerd, so I've got like a budget and I've got a bunch of formulas all set up. So um, based on my projections and how much money we're able to put towards the principal, we should have it paid off within three and a half years. Whoop, whoop. Nice. Um, yeah, pretty exciting. So, but my question is, um, we don't have any money in re- for retirement. Um, so I know, I think part of the program is you start, you get all your debt paid off except the house. Then you mm-hmm. start putting 15% towards 401k or retirement accounts. And then, then you start working on paying off the house, I think is the process. So I'm kind of jumping the gun, doing the house part first yeah. because... Yeah, so I guess my question is like, is that is that fine? Because once um we have the house paid off, then I'm like, all right, let's just start piling money into retirement and setting money aside to like get like a rental house. Like that's kind of so, what I'm thinking to do. So right now you're working your own plan, which is the Thomas plan, and if if that's what you want to do, that's cool. But since you called us, you know we we work things through a series of baby steps, and you were close to it. Um, the first for those of you listening, and also for you, Thomas, the first step is baby step one: thousand dollars saved. Then baby step two: you're paying off all of your debt except the mortgage uh, using the debt snowball. And then after that, we don't go to investing. We go to baby step three, which is making sure we have three to six months um, emergency fund saved, so that we're not using our investments as an emergency fund. And then after that, baby step four, Thomas, is when we start investing 15%. So you are kind of doing this thing. You got it ghetto rigged a little bit and doing it your own way. I would really urge you and suggest to use it the correct way, because we know that this is the plan that has helped millions of people uh, build wealth. Uh, George is one of those people. And there's there's method to the madness. Uh, we want to make sure we have that savings first, because when folks don't have savings, their 401k becomes their savings. 
And that's a horrible place to be because you're hit with penalties and you're hit with fees. Um, Paying off the home before you have the rest of your debt paid off, also not a great idea. So there's a reason that this works the way that it works. Um, Does that kind of answer some of your questions or give you peace about it? Yeah, no, it it does. And yeah, I forgot to mention, we do have the about three to six months of money saved up as well. So I I forgot to mention that. We do have that stuff. But yeah, it's just I've got the retirement account and then the house payment kind of flipped a bit. Yeah. And and let me also encourage you in this way. You know, when it comes to your retirement, you want that compound interest to work for you for as long as possible. You know, Mm -hmm. the time is the key on that. So no, I would not pay off the mortgage first because that's time that you could have spent in the market that you're now sacrificing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And that's kind of what I was. How old are you two? Uh, I'm 31. She's 32. You got plenty of time, but you got to get started today. Turn that thing on 15% household income into retirement accounts and whatever's left, we can start throwing at that mortgage. You know, George, it's funny. I hear people calling all the time and, and they're calling us, but they, they're doing what Dave would call ish, Mm. right? They're, they're familiar with the baby steps. Maybe they've been listening, but they've kind of developed their own, their own style. It's like, well, I'll just take a little bit of that. I'm going to grab some crab rangoon over here, you Mm -hmm. know, but the problem with that is you don't get results. You get ish results. That's right. And what's it based off of? Because you don't have a track record. 10 million people doing this and becoming Baby Steps millionaires. I mean, that's enough social proof for me. Okay. Because I was an idiot who thought my plan was going to somehow be better than that. I know, that's right. I would rather go with the proven track record, a plan that has helped millions of people, not just myself, but my guy George Camel over here, build wealth, become millionaire status. This is The Ramsey Show. Look, I love real estate, and I want you to have a house, but I don't want a house to have you. That's why you need to get in touch with Churchill Mortgage to make sure you do this right. These guys are awesome. They'll help you get on a smarter mortgage plan because they're committed to doing what's right for you. That means they check in every year with free consultations to help you stay on the right plan. They show you how to save money and interest so you can build wealth faster. They walk you through the total cost of your loan so you can make the best choice. Basically, they care. That's why we call them Ramsey Trusted. You can achieve debt-free home ownership, and Churchill is here to help. Go to their site, churchillmortgage.com slash Ramsey to start your approval or get more information. My name is Jade Warshaw. I am your host today, along with my buddy, George Camel. And uh, we want you guys to give us a call. We want to discuss the things that are important to you today. So give us a call. The number is 888-825-5225. And uh, just before the break, George and I were, we were having some, some pretty interesting conversation. Heated discussions. Heated discussion. George, I felt like you were losing your temper there. I tend to do that over (laughs) trivial things. So here's what happened. We just released a brand new episode of Smart Money Happy Hour, uh, which Rachel Cruz and I host. And the entire episode is about junk fees. And so the title is There's a Fee for That and We're Over It. And so we just get, we're getting heated in, in debates yeah. <laughs> about should there be fees for some of this stuff? So I want to run it by you, Jade, run okay. it by our audience, and uh, you guys respond in your cars or your homes or wherever you're listening. So, for example, Postmates, which is food delivery, they add a delivery fee and charges more if you want your food delivered without additional stops, which who's like, yeah, you can stop three times. I'll take my food cold. It's fine. I don't trust these places anyway. Well, I've seen video like someone ate a piece of my pizza. They took some of my fries. They took a nugget. Of course they did. Think about it. You go through the drive-thru. If you go and get McDonald's fries just for your family, 
of course you're dipping in the bag having a couple of crumb uh, fries. Uh. You're telling me that these folks are going to Chick-fil-A, Burger King, It's one King, of many McDonald's. reasons why I don't use these services because I have trust issues. Oh, they're, they're eating the fries and they got dirty fingers. I'm telling you that right now. I don't know where those fingers have been. <laughs> okay, here's one that I actually agree with. Uber and Lyft now have a wait time fee. So here's the deal. There's a charge incurred if a driver has to wait for you more than two minutes upon pickup. That's fine as long as I get to charge a fee when I have to wait for them. Oh, but see, that's out of their... Like, what if they hit traffic? No, because, George, here's the thing. You're, They're hustling. You're, you're deciding every time you're like, am I going to do Uber or Lyft? That right? is a, I always do the quote with them both and see who's cheaper. But he, that's the thing. You pick the one that's cheaper and maybe the time is less. And then you see, you look in the little, the little car is flipping right to left. I'm so cheap. I'll choose the option that's like, hey, if you wait f 14 extra minutes, we'll give you $3 off. I'm like, oh, done. Gosh. I'm willing to wait. Look, I hate it when it, they tell me it's going to take 15 minutes. And before I know it, I've been waiting 20 minutes. So as long as I can charge the same way they charge. Wow. <laughs> I'm just trying to be fair, George. Okay. Well, how about this one? Airbnb. This one grinds my gears. They'll add on everything from cleaning fees to cancellation fees to service fees to insurance packages to where I just stay at hotels now. I just truly don't do Airbnb unless we have a big group of people and we all want to be in a, in a house together. Now, see, these charges kind of make sense to me because I'm like, OK, they got to clean it. I want to know the, that if the place costs one hundred dollars a night and you're charging me a two hundred fifty dollar cleaning fee. It just doesn't make sense to stay there. But can I also say, I feel like when people go to Airbnbs, it's like we're walling out. Like we're we're going hard. Like there's parties. Money is is not is not an issue for yeah. Jade when she's at an Airbnb. No, 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 not me. <laughs> not me, George. I'm just saying like uh, even on the commercials, like you get a house with your friends. Like yeah, I but feel here's like the you issue. can I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of things that can go be destroyed here's in an Airbnb the house. They're going to charge you $250 for the cleaning fee, but they're still going to be like, but also I need you to strip the sheets, start a load of laundry, <laughs> start the dishwasher. The dog. I need you to feed the, the lawn needs to be mowed. And there's a creaky door. If you could take some WD-40 to that on your way out, that'd be great. A honey I'm out. List. I'm out. You so, uh, okay. I see. I see. I see. Yeah. And, uh, travel is a big one. There's a lot of fees in the travel world on oh, top of gosh. Airbnbs. So airlines, fees. And with, you know, some of these Frontier and Spirit, the flights are like $4. But then they'll nickel and dime you and be like, oh, you wanted it to breathe? It's an extra $5 <laughs> if you want to breathe. Sorry, sir. I hate sir. that. Look, I go, can I say Spirit on You can here? say it. So there's a airline that is called Spirit. You just said it. <laughs> Guys, it is not worth it. It is like a Greyhound bus in the skies. The I old once, sky bus. I once went on one and there was graffiti. You know how, like, in the eighth grade bathroom, yeah. there's, like, you know, people just write stuff. People, the seats had graffiti on it. And I'm like, is this what I paid tw an extra $25 to have my seat fee plus my bag fee and I got to pay for a water? Are you kidding me? Oh, it's it's out of control. Which, you know, I'm, I'm a Southwest fan. They just went through this whole debacle. But they do give you two bags for free. That's true, but then I got to fight over my seat. I don't want to have to bite somebody's forearm to get my seat. You know I'm what I'm saying? I'm not big enough to intimidate anyone into <laughs> not sitting next to me. I'm prime I'm prime bait. You know, if I'm sitting in a seat, they're like, I'm sitting next to that guy because you know I got the armrest. George, all you got to do is put your glasses on the end of your nose and look down your nose. Oh, at I me. puff up like a blowfish when I'm in a seat on Southwest. <laughs> I'm taking up as much space as I can. I'm mean mugging him. I might start uh, coughing. <laughs> yes, that's all you have to do. All you have to do is start coughing and sneezing and nobody's going to sit next to you. Well, the next VJ, this is a new one. AMC movie theaters have now added variable pricing called sightline seating. So uh, if you want to have a seat that's not in the front row, you might pay an extra for two bucks to get that prime seat okay i don't like this uh, no they're have, treating it like a concert yeah it's not i'm not that. going to see taylor swift the screen's plenty big i just have a hard time whenever something has been the same forever like it's always been like that you've done nothing new and now you're just charging for something that's always been mm. does that make sense sure like what did you guys add that is of value you've just decided hey these front row seats have always been here huh, let's charge more I, it's unfair. Well, and companies can just do it. And obviously it makes their bottom line look better, increases yeah. their profits. And uh, concerts and games, this happens a lot with these major events, these processing fees. StubHub is one of them. They add 15 to 20% in service fees on top of the ticket costs. Wow. Ticketmaster. These people are the worst service fee, delivery fee, yeah. taxes, venue fee. They start blaming the clients and the artists. And uh, there's non-refundable fees uh, as well. And I hate that. And, and specifically this one, I don't like because I feel like 
the music industry, they're putting, they're putting the dollar on us when y'all need to just figure out how to get these musicians the money that they deserve for their streams. I just don't for go their to records. shows anymore is what Man, happened. Yeah, that's what happens. I don't. Well, I am going to see Kenny Loggins here in a minute. Wow. Still touring? Old yeah, Kenny? This is his How last, old is he? This is his last tour. I, he's got to be in his 70s. How do we know it's not like a Weekend at Bernie situation? <laughs> they just got him up there like a Chuck E. Cheese no, no. animatronic. He, he, he can still sing. This is his last one, though. I cannot wait. Kenny Loggins. All Love right. it. <laughs> I like this next part, George. Okay. This is fees that we, we want to bring to life. That should be a thing. So these are your pet peeves that you wish you could charge people for. Okay. Do you okay. have any of these? Uh, yes, I have some, but I want you to say this All right, first here's one, one that first. really <laughs> gets to me. A fee for people who say supposedly instead of supposedly. <laughs> yes, it's nuanced, but they're the same people who say espresso instead oh, of espresso. Now you want to see me give somebody an eye jammy real quick is when they say espresso. It's like pff, right in the eye. It's not express. It's espresso espresso people oh. uh, how about this one a fee for people who, who aggressively lean their seat all the way back on airplanes <laughs> these people i saw one where a girl threw all of her hair to the seat behind her so that it wasn't up against her seat look if if you've never been hit in the eye with somebody's hair when they flip their hair that is that's number one it's painful that's an assault you gotta be you gotta know who's around you when uh, you do that okay. okay what's your fee what's your pet peeve fee okay i'm gonna say this and then i'm gonna be the worst offender but when people say the word like every other word uh. i mean like george is kind of like i mean i was just like going over here and like my money like it's like a swear uh, jar i think i just made four dollars from you just doing it's that. terrible the like jar it's starts terrible. out with your friends and see how much money you make now, there are some fees that I think are fair. I don't want to just put fees, okay. you know. Um, one is, you know, valet parking. Yeah, That's yes. a convenience. Yes, especially at the airport. There was one, though, that's like local. You know, we live in the suburbs out here. And this restaurant had a huge parking lot. It's right there. I can go. The parking spot is three feet from where I am. <laughs> and they want to go take my car to move it three feet to charge me. Wow. I went, now I'll do the self-park. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's one right. that's legit, you know. At the airport, though, valet will change your life. Not if you're in baby step two. Though, I've never done valet at an airport. What, George? With your bougie self, let me tell you. I know. Get get on it because this I'm will change your life. I'm a child of immigrants. Okay, I do the like the <laughs> hotel parking and take the shuttle so that I can pay seven dollars a day instead of the twenty four dollars <laughs> a day. So that's me. There's some things I am unwilling to pay a fee for. I get that. I, some, isn't it true? Sometimes $20 seems like nothing. And then sometimes $20 feels like the most expensive thing in the world. You're like, $20? It's the principle, Jade. Well, yeah. hey, if you want to hear more about this, Rachel Cruz and I have a great time talking about it on the latest episode of Smart Money Happy Hour. You can listen to it. You can watch it now. We can see our reactions on our YouTube channel, yes. Smart Money Happy Hour. We'll link it in the show notes and put it in the YouTube description for you all. Let us know what you think. Add in your fees you're the most angry about yes. in the comments let's get angry together start a revolution <laughs> against fees i love it i love it this is the ramsey show to the Ramsey Show. My name is Jade Warshaw. I'm joined today by George Campbell, and we're taking calls about your life, your money, the things that are concerning you, the things that are keeping you up at night, anything that's on your mind. We're here to talk about it today. You can give us a call. The number is 888-825-5225. And let me tell you something. If you're a new listener, and you want to dive deeper into the Ramsey baby steps, go to RamseySolutions.com and click on the Get Started button. You may hear us talk about things all the time like the baby steps or, you know, a rule about this or a rule about that. Or we use the jargon, you know, and we, we think that y'all know the answer. But if you're like, what are they talking about? This is the thing for you to do. We'll help you figure out the best next step for you on your financial journey. Uh, there's lots of resources there for you guys to understand what this is all about. These baby steps, all of this. Uh, it's based on on exactly where you're at today. So it's super helpful. So head over to RamseySolutions.com and click get started. All right, George, 
Let's go ahead and take some calls. I think we we're got ready. several on the board here. We got Logan from Kansas City. What's going on, Logan? How can we help today? Hey, guys. Yeah, thanks for taking the call. Um, so basically, it's just kind of a housing market question. Um, uh, here's the, the scenario. Um, my wife and I own a house, and we currently rent the upstairs for about 1100 a month. The mortgage is only 790 on the home, and we live in the basement pretty much for free uh, by doing that. Wow. We all just kind of share the kitchen and the laundry room and the, the common spaces, but everybody's got their own space, and uh, and we're good. Mm-hmm. Um, the the offside to that is that, you know, we have to go through a garage to get to the kitchen, and, you know, we don't really have our own kitchen, so it's a shared space. And so it would be nice to have our own space, given that we're married. Mm-hmm. Um, so the scenario would be, you know, looking at potentially purchasing another home and turning this into a full-fledged rental. Um, if we did that, we'd probably be able to get around 1600 a month for the property. So that'd be an additional 800, uh, of cash flow, not including all the expenses that go along with that. But, um, so yeah, we're, we're considering buying a property, getting some of our own space and then turning this into rental. Um, what's, what's, what's your guys' thoughts there? So would you buy another property near, near that property? Yes. Yeah. Uh, still, still same KC Metro area. And would you do that with cash? Unfortunately, no. Um, yeah, our, our situation right now would be probably a 3% down situation, um, live in it and, and kind of 3% conventional. Mm. Well, there's there's a lot of risk there when you're carrying two mortgages now. And if one thing goes wrong with this plan that looks great on paper, it leaves you guys in a real precarious situation. So that's my big worry with this. And we always recommend – we love – real estate. We love rental property, but we only recommend doing that once you have a primary residence paid for and you buy the next one in cash, your investment property, which I know sounds like, well, that's years away. Yes. It also lets you walk into this with a lot of peace. That's a good point. Okay. Because I mean, the spread right now you're making is about what, 300 bucks. And that's without anything going wrong. Something needing to be replaced, repairs, whatever else happens. So you're making about three grand off this deal. So it's not like it's changing your life, even to rent out the upstairs. Right. And so to me, is it if you said, hey, I'll give you a three grand pay cut, but you get to go through your house freely, I'm taking that deal. What would you make if you sold the house, sold the, sold the house that you're in now and purchased something that makes sense for you and your wife? You've got your privacy, you've got your own kitchen, you've got your own space. What would that look like? Um... So yeah, we've got a little over twenty percent into the home. Um, it might be worth around two hundred. Um, so let's see. I, I owe one hundred ten on it, so we'd, we'd probably be able to walk away with uh, eighty, mm-hmm. eighty thousand ish, maybe, and then put that down payment towards something something that we really wanted and really liked. What's your household income? Um, we we average probably around seventy together. Okay. So how quickly could you pay off your mortgage at the current residence? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I've not done the math on that. But if we can, I mean, we're, we're probably around uh, 1500 a month as far as what we can save. Um, so that would allow us to kind of put uh, that much down on, on anything else per month. Do you guys have any other debt? Something like that. Uh, we do not. We're both we're both debt free. We've got some um, investments, both of us, that are in the stock market. And I've actually kind of paused mine um, just for the time being, but I, I do need to get those back up and running again as well. And um, you have uh, a fully funded monthly. emergency fund. We do. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'd get those investments back oh, up yeah. to fifteen percent. Whatever's left, start throwing it at the house. And if you just don't want to rent her anymore, there's nothing wrong with saying, we're just not going to yeah. make this right. this amount of profit and we're going to have our life back and we'll be back in the real estate investing game one day, but that day's not today. Would you keep that same house as your personal residence without the renter or does it not make sense? Would you would you move into something different? No, yeah, I think I think the house we're in now currently makes a lot of sense. Um, so it, it, it may make the most sense to just take it over for yeah. our, ourselves and and kind of then, you know, start snowballing and, and saving and getting that ball rolling. And like you said, 
um, get this paid off and, and then purchase the next rental property. Yeah. So you've got a lot of options there. The option that you don't have is to have two mortgages because that right there is a recipe uh, for Especially disaster. Especially 3% down and having no Ooh. equity in that thing. And it's just, that scares the crap out of me. Absolutely. We've got time to take one more call. This is Connor from Austin, Texas. Let's make it pretty quick, Connor. Let us go. With, let, let us know how we can help you. Yeah, of course. Thanks y'all for taking the call. So my question is around, I am starting a new job and I had a 401k match for 4% of my previous employer. So I have a 401k. Mm-hmm. This new employer doesn't offer a 401k until the first year, but then it's a 6% match. So I'm just wondering what to do with my old employer 401k in the meantime. Aha. So it's still sitting with the old employer. It is. And it's a traditional 401k or Roth? It's a traditional but there was a – okay, so I would just do a direct rollover to a traditional IRA. That's going to give you the most control, flexibility, and investment options. Okay, got it. Would I be able to roll that over to my employer 401k after the year is up once I'm eligible? Depending on your employer's 401k, you may be able to roll it in there. But personally, I would rather have full control of it by putting it into an IRA, right. which is one of the benefits of leaving an employer. You have the ability to move it into an IRA. Okay, got it. And then when I'm eligible for my employer's 401k, just start from scratch and contribute to that? Yes. Do you have any debt? I have a solar panel on my house, kind of my stupid tax, if you will, but outside of that, no no, no debt. Uh, well, here's a plan. Uh, before you invest any more dollars, what if we could get that solar panel paid off before the 401k benefit kicks in? That is something I've thought about and something that I could do this year and then just start recontributing again to that 401k. Do you have any savings? I do. I have about 6500 Okay. And what's left on the solar panel loan? About 29000 I should be doing the minimum payments. Okay. So we could take five grand from your savings, throw it at the solar panel loan, and, and get about the business of paying it off. Could you pay it off within the year with your income? Uh, not my income. If I switched to a commission-based job, but I'm thinking some commission, I should be able to pay it off outright within a year. Love it. Well, commission's great because you can just go kill stuff and drag it home and bust your butt. Right. So that would be my goal. Uh, and I think that'd be really cool if you could have a three to six months emergency fund with no debt and be ready to invest when that one-year benefit kicks in for the 401k. I love that idea. I feel like that's the way to go. I like having just something dangling in front of me. I think as humans, we need that behaviorally. Yes. Just to stay motivated. And so, you know, when we were paying off our house, I said, I'm not going to upgrade my my 09 Civic with a bumper hanging off until I pay off the house. And <laughs> Absolutely. It, it's so much more rewarding at that point. I mean, I think that's the way that the, the baby steps are designed, right? You know, I say it all the time. I feel like one and two, you're just like, you're just busting it. And you cannot wait because all the money that you're giving, it's to somebody else. You're paying off debt. You're giving them, them the money. And then it's like, but if I could just get to baby step three and I get to pocket everything, right? I feel like the whole thing is designed that way. And then it's like, oh, I finally get to start investing. It's like you've waited for that moment. So it's all about, like you said, that carrot dangling in front of you. And when you start to be able to enjoy those moments, it makes it even more sweet. We say personal finances. It's only 20% head knowledge. It's 80% behavior. Yes. It's psychology. Yes. It's not about the math. And once you get a hold of that, it changes you on top of changing your money. Absolutely. Because most people that you talk to, they know they know the right thing to do. Yes, I'm supposed to save money. Yes, debt is bad. Credit cards are bad. But they don't do what it takes. It's the behavior that makes the difference. Well, that does it for today's show. Be sure to join us next time. And remember this, when it comes to changing your life and your money, you can tell me that you won't do it. But please don't tell me that you can't. With God, all things are possible. Hey, what's up, guys? It's Jade. If you love the show and want a deeper dive on your money journey, we have a weekly newsletter that gives you trending and helpful articles and tips on following the Ramsey way. Just go to RamseySolutions.com today to sign up for our newsletter. Again, that's RamseySolutions.com to sign up for our weekly newsletter. from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions. Broadcasting from the pods, moving and storage studio, it's The Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create amazing relationships. I'm your host, Jade Warshaw, and I am joined by the wonderful 
illustrious. Wow. George Campbell. I know you like when so I say kind. illustrious. Illustrious makes me feel, it's, it's a timeless adjective. <laughs> it definitely is. And we're here to take calls about your life and your money. George, he, he is an expert on investing, insurance, all sorts of things. So kind. Uh, I'll help you with the baby steps. I'll help you get out of debt. I'll help you stay motivated. Give us a call today. The Which, number... Jade, I will say the number first because we got to get the calls on the board. But I got I got something to talk about. <laughs> okay. The number is 888-825-5225. George, what do you got to say? Well, I had to ask. You just hosted the record-breaking Virtual Financial Peace University class yesterday. <gasps> and I just wanted to know how it went. That's right. Yes, George is correct. Uh, we did. We, we, we started uh, a Financial Peace University class with myself leading. The first class was last night. George, we had 1,081 people sign up for this class. Can you believe it? That's wild. Unbelievable. It was great. And this is like a boot camp version you're doing in five weeks, meeting twice a week. Correct. Wow. Yes, we're going super speed. People are changing their lives. This, like... The stuff, it really works. Okay, so it's too late to sign up for yours, but it's that's not right. too late to sign up for a class. It, yes. won't, it may not be as great as Jade's, but that's a high bar. I mean, look, <laughs> it's going to be great. We had to close off this class because we didn't want that many folks. You know, it's got to be helpful for you guys. So we didn't want to go past a thousand. But uh, yeah, you can't get in mind, but please, please, please. We have amazing coordinators yes. all over the country who, who help us run these things. Yeah. And man, they're the arms and feet of this place. We so appreciate them. That's right. And you can do the Financial Peace University class in person, like in small groups. There's different groups that meet all around the country. Or if you're like, I'm not trying to be around folks. I like staying in my house. Then you can do... Or you got seven kids and it's hard to get yeah. out. You can still do it virtually. Yeah, you can do the virtual version. So whatever you do, this is your year to change your finances. This is your year to change your life. I was talking to the folks earlier today and a guy asked me, he said, what do you do? How uh, how do you stay motivated? And I'm like, you just have to want to change. The pain of staying the same has to be greater than the pain of changing. You've mm. got to be like, I can't live like this anymore. Something's got to give, something's got to shake. And that's when you sign up for Financial Peace University. And that's when you start listening to shows like The Ramsey Show. If you're walking through this, good on you for tuning into a show like this to stay motivated. And let me tell you something. Uh, if you like this show, if this show has changed your life, please share it with somebody. All right. Share the share the good news with somebody who is out there broken, struggling because they need this, too. If you're listening on uh, YouTube, uh, sh subscribe, subscribe to the show. It's great for you. It's great for us. It kicks it up in the algorithm so more people see it and it puts it top of mind for you as well. So you can continue uh, to consume this and also leave a review. We would love if you wrote something nice about the show, whether it's on the podcast, whether it's on YouTube, say something nice so that all the haters out there sipping on that hate. Raid will shut it up. All right. That's right. I know that's right. So let's take a couple of calls here. We got Roslyn over here in Richmond, Virginia. Hey, I have family in Richmond, Virginia. What's going on, Roslyn? Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? I can. Hi. Hi, Jay. Hi, George. Um, thanks for taking my call. Um, I'm calling because uh, I came across Dave Ramsey in January 2022, last year. Uh -huh. um, really improved my life, got the debt out the way and everything. Um, but, of course, I made a lot of bad decisions before. But I want to um, buy a home by the end of this year. And uh, uh, y'all kind of say, okay, manual underwriting and, well, basically to get rid of your credit score. Mm -hmm. Um well, I was wondering if that's really the good um, strategy for me because in my past I have a foreclosure. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to make things harder for myself um, if I were to have no credit score, which is actually improved now because I've been going through a lot of things, being off debt and everything. So um, what do you think about that? I mean, I, I'm not sure. It kind of makes me kind of nervous. To, um, I'm not using the credit cards, but they still are, you know, on my report. And uh, So how so, long ago was the foreclosure? 2016. And it's coming up on seven years on September this year. So it'll get cleared from your history? Does it really? Because I don't. If well, from your report, it may mm -hmm. always be on your history, but as far as if you pull the report, it's not going to affect your chances of, you know, getting a mortgage. And it depends on what you right. did. You know, what was this? Do you know what kind of bankruptcy this was? Well, it's the one where I had to pay a lot of money back. It took money on my check. So it was know. a payment plan? And that went on. 
um, yeah, I was paying it plan, and um, I paid a lot of money out of my check that went on for I forgot how many years, like five years, like four years, something like that. Well, generally, so that you've got to wait four years after part. bankruptcy to be able to apply for you know a conventional mortgage loan. And it sounds like you're not at a, a place to be a homeowner based on what you've told us because you still have some debt hanging around. How much debt do you have left? No, no. I have no debt. Oh, okay. Last okay. Year, because when I, I came across Dave in uh, January and I did everything. I mean, he used to say this thing about, you know, the new home, the home mortgage paid off is better than BMW. Yeah. So anyway, I got rid of my BMW and a great big payment. <laughs> I got a Toyota. I mean, I wiped that off. Very I good. My- student loan, pay the credit cards. And so now I, all I have is um, I have an apartment. I've been living here like, you know, for like <laughs> double digit years. Um, I'm older. I, I, I like the idea of one day not having to pay for a roof over my head. So that's of why so I what? would really like to go on and purchase a home. I have saved so far, like, um, uh, I've saved minus my emergency fund, which is twenty five thousand. So I have an extra forty thousand, and I know okay. I can have another forty five by the end of the year. Awesome! So you'd have eighty five thousand to put down. Yes. Very good. Hey, can That's I just hold goal. off You're and amazing. say, very good. You had a, a messed up past with this money, but you have totally turned it around, and I'm just yes. so proud of you. That's incredible. I thank God for finding him because it is very late, but still it's better than never. Yes. Very good. Very good. (laughs) Have you contacted like Churchill Mortgage and said, hey, I went through this foreclosure seven years ago. Here's where I'm at. I have I'll have this much down by the end of the year. Have you kind of looked into it and done some homework? No, I, I didn't even know if that was something that was that was a good strategy. I don't know if I should just go on the normal with my well, it'll help you. Whatever. What's I mean, your credit score right now? Um, right now, it's 730. Right. Okay. Around seven, mm-hmm. And based on your numbers, if you're walking in with a 730 credit score and you've got 85000 to put down, you know, obviously depending on the house and your income, mm-hmm. I don't see why they, they wouldn't approve you for a loan, but still do some homework. Call our friends at Churchill Mortgage and they'll walk you through the process and they'll explain to you exactly what you'll need to do in order to become a homeowner. And we are cheering you on Man, along the way. What a journey. That just goes to show your past does not have to be Mm-mm. your future. This woman went ahead and changed her whole life. Yet again, another thing that proves this plan works if you work it. She went from bankruptcy to now forty. She had to all 80, the excuses, dollars. and she said, "I'm going to get back up. I'm Ooh, doing this thing." Love it. This is the Ramsey Show. If you're like most people, your home is your most valuable asset. And when you want to make improvements, it can feel like everything costs too much or takes too long. But something as simple as custom window coverings from Blinds.com can completely change your space and add value to your home. We've recommended Blinds.com for over a decade, so you know you can trust them. From blinds, drapes, and shutters to motorized shades, they make it easy and affordable to upgrade your entire home, and their team is ready to help with everything, from design consultation to measuring and installation. Plus, there are never any misleading quotes or hidden fees. Everything's backed by their 100% satisfaction guarantee, and shipping is always free. See why Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings. Visit Blinds.com to save up to 40% off everything site-wide. Go to Blinds.com for more information. to the Ramsey Show. My name is Jade Warshaw, your host. I'm here with George Camel. Give us a call today. The number is 888-825-5225. And 
If you're planning to move soon, we know that it can be expensive. I know firsthand because your girl just moved from South Florida here to Tennessee. But I've got great news for you. Our studio sponsor, Pods Moving and Storage, wants to help someone move for free. Just get a quote at pods.com slash Ramsey between February 20th and March 3rd. So you got two more days to do this deal and enter to win. It's really that simple. Matter of fact, my buddy called me the other day. They were like, I entered the pods moving storage thing. I was like, yes. One listener will get a free move valued up to $5,000 and $10,000 in cold, hard cash. That's what I'm talking about. If you're following the math, that's a total value, George, of 15. That's legit. 15 smack 15,000 smackers i wish Man. i was eligible i know right Man, not for serious. us so kind of them look pods just made moving that much easier george with flexibility that you need the control that you want and customer service can we just take a moment for customer that's service? that's an oxymoron in today's world i know right we're not used but to it pods is known for it they are and if you're looking for a company that is going to help you on your moving uh, on your move, on your terms, I love that, then it's Pods. Pods is the only Ramsey trusted moving provider that's out there. So go to pods.com slash Ramsey to enter for your free chance to win this free move. And you get the $10,000 in cash. So today, go on to pods.com slash Ramsey. I love it. I love it. And George, we got a question of the day here. Let's take a look at this question of the day. It comes from Katie. North Dakota. Here's what she says. Once I become debt free and cut up all my credit cards, will this hurt my credit score? Lower credit scores mean higher interest rates on the house I would like to buy in the future. Or do you recommend saving for a house with cash, even though that might take a long time? Mm. This is a great question because the credit score industry is so confusing. Oh, yeah. And they're very, they, they keep it with lock and key. And so there are a few things we know about how the credit score is made up. But yes, yes canceling your card could mean that your credit score takes a dip. Yeah. Because that makes sense. You pay off your debt and close your accounts and they go, not okay with us. Well, I mean, think about it. The whole credit score is based on your relationship with debt, right? How much debt you have, how long have you had the debt? You know, what's your debt to income? We're like, all, debt, ever, debt, all debt, 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 <laughs> uh, debt. Yeah, that. payment history is the biggest one. 35% of your scores, that's the factor. Amounts owed is 30%. Length of credit history, another 15%. New credit, 10%. Credit mix, the variety of credit, another 10%. And so mm. it's all having to do with how much you play kissy face with the bank. Man, I'm not doing it. I, I'll be the first to tell you guys, when we canceled our credit cards and the ones that were in my name, uh, yeah, my credit score took a dip. I'll be honest, my credit score was not great to begin with. It was probably like 630 or something like that. And yeah, it went down. And then it had a, a period of time where it just kind of stayed the same and did nothing. But let me tell you something, George. As soon as that last debt was paid off, it went down to zero. Woo! That's right. So what we're talking about here uh, is not a tanking of your credit score. It means your credit score becomes invisible or indeterminable. Yep. So six to 12 months after you pay off all your debt, you close all those accounts, six to 12 months later, that score disappears. Yep. And here's the good news. Once you cut up your cards and become completely debt-free, you're not out of the woods. You got to have a fully funded emergency fund and start saving up the down payment. And so you actually don't need uh, the credit score for that process if you go through manual underwriting. Yes, come on and tell them, George. So manual underwriting is a little known fact. I did a, a quick clip from the show, went viral on social media, <laughs> and people think, oh, I can get around the system. I have a terrible score, but I can still get a no, no score loan. No, no. it's in the name, no score loan. And Churchill Mortgage is the number one lender in the country that does these. Yeah. And so that, you know, if you go through Churchill Mortgage, for an example, and you want manual underwriting, you got to have no credit score at all to do these manual underwriting, no score loans, which means you're completely debt free. You've got to have a good down payment. Mm -hmm. You know, let's, let's say minimum 10% down and you go, you got to do the 15 year, which I know is crazy in today's culture. It's worth it. But if you do those things, hear me say this, you will have the same exact interest rate as someone with excellent credit. That's and right. I verified this with our friends at Churchill. I've had multiple discussions. We ran numbers where we actually showed people your quotes for your mortgages. Yeah. And they found if you do 10% down on a 15-year fixed with a good, you know, your, your numbers all check out, your W-2s are there, your income is there. Yep. You've got proof of uh, 12 months of rental history verifi verified by a landlord or even your parents. Mm -hmm. And you have other utility bills you've been paying on time for 12 months, your mm -hmm. insurance premiums, your cell phone bills, your utility bills. All of that counts towards this financial picture yeah. to where a real person says you are approved for the mortgage at a great rate. And let me, can I just say, because I know somebody, regardless of how well and how eloquently George just described that, 
there's still somebody sitting out there going, mm, I don't know. And can I just tell you, I was that person when Sam and I were going through the baby steps, you know, we were like, there were some things that I was like, I know Dave is saying this. I know George and Rachel and all them are saying this, but can it really be true? Mm. I'm telling you, I'm sitting in this seat telling you it works. Credit score went to zero. And I was like, oh, I was excited, but I was a little bit nervous. And then I did what they told me to do. We went to Churchill Mortgage. Jeff Green, shout out to Jeffrey Jeff. Green at Churchill Mortgage. He walked us through the process. And here's the thing. It's even easier if you've got like a standard nine to five job because it's easy to show, you know, all the records and everything they want to show. But as a small business owner, it still worked. The proof is in the pudding. That's I'm sitting right. here telling you. And I've done the same. Ooh. I went through this process. And the crazy part is people still commented going BS. And I went, what part of this do you not understand where I just told you? I did it. And then here's the frustrating part, Jade. People started popping in the comments going, well, yeah, look at that guy's skin color. Of course he got approved for a mortgage. What? 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 So, Jade, can you verify? Uh, look, look, the melanin is real. And your girl's got a house. And she got it on a zero credit score. Now, here's the thing. Why do you want to be right so bad? That's what I want to know. Why do you want to be right that you cannot buy a home with a zero credit score? What is that getting you? What is it getting you? I kind of like the fact that we live in a world where you don't have to bow down to the credit gods and there's still a way for you to make a way without borrowing money from credit. Why are you mad about that? I'm mad. Y'all got me mad. We got her riled up. It's so true, Jade. We can rise above this broken system. Yes. And people just go, because they've never done it, and because there's so much baggage, there's so much shame, there's so much crap that they've had to deal with financially, they just go, well, that might work for them, but it's not going to work for me. But what's crazy about our plan is it works every time you work it. And when you become completely debt-free with an emergency fund, yeah. and you're patient, you save up that down payment, you make the sacrifices you need to make— you can become a homeowner without a score. Yeah. Regardless of your skin color and where you came from and all the baggage that you come to the door with, you can win financially. You but can win. But it starts when you put all that baggage aside and say, I'm going to win in spite of all that. Boom, George. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you want to play with debt, if you want to go and do the credit card deal, you want to do the credit card shuffle, you want to play with assets and liabilities and leverage, and do go ahead and go on and do that and get yourself an 800 credit score and go buy your house and have trouble sleeping at night. But for the rest of us... As for me and my house. As for me and my house, we are not going to serve these FICO gods. We are not going to do it. We are going to have our own money and our own account doing our own thing. And if you want to be mad about it, you go ahead and be mad all day because we're going to be laughing all the way to the bank. And we ain't mad about that's it that's right we want to share the good news so well, and, and then with this credit score stuff even aside from home ownership people go well jade your insurance rates are going to be terrible and how are you going to rent a car and, and a hotel listen i have lived my life without the credit score using a debit card yep and i even checked i checked every major rental car company's policies they all have a debit card policy yes they do and yes you might have a slight slightly higher deposit yeah you got to have a little money in your account but aside from that, it wasn't much different than a normal process. No. And the same goes for pretty much everything. Renting, you know, yep. renting an Airbnb, getting a hotel. Yeah. Uh, and car loans. That's a big one. People say, well, Jade, how am I going to get a car loan? You don't. You don't get it. Even, you pay cash. Even fraud. You know, people have said, well, you got to have a credit card. What if you have fraud? I'm like, well, number one, I got Xander to cover that. And two, anytime I've ever had fraud on my account, they, they've given me the money back. It's the same thing. You don't need credit cards. That's a lie. I'm done That's with this credit score. That's a lie from the pit. Come at me, FICO. Come at me, bro. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, my goodness. When it comes to credit, George and Jade Warshaw are not playing. George Campbell and Jade Warshaw, we do not have the same last Hashtag name. Hashtag debit life. <laughs> I know that's right. We got that debt free lifestyle and we want that for you as well. This is The Ramsey Show. We've been doing business at Ramsey for more than 30 years. By now, we're a well-oiled machine, but it wasn't always that way. Yes, we've always had a vision, always had determination, and a drive to help people, but what we didn't have was one central place to access all our numbers 
so that we could get further ahead or quickly see when we needed to pivot. We were always jumping back and forth between different systems and spreadsheets. So when NetSuite by Oracle helped us wrangle our revenue, inventory, expenses, and more into one place, it was a game changer. And NetSuite's number one cloud financial system can help your business gain the same visibility because businesses thrive on timely data. And NetSuite's real-time analytics can help your business have immediate access to your numbers daily so you always know where you stand and you can move quickly. So go to netsuite.com slash Ramsey today and set up a free product tour. That's netsuite.com slash Ramsey. What's up, guys? You're listening to The Ramsey Show. I'm Jade Warshaw, joined by George Camel. We're taking your calls today, so give us a call. Uh, the number is 888-825-5225. We're willing to discuss whatever it is that you guys want to discuss as it relates to your life and your money. We're going to take a call from Brett in Kansas City. Second one from Kansas City today. What's going on, Brett? Yeah, so um, I was calling because uh, so for the past five years since my wife and I got married, we've uh, we've followed you know like the the Ramsey plan and principles and everything, and we've been debt free since uh, since we were first married all the way until uh, we got our first mortgage. Um, but we did incur some debt uh, at the beginning of the last year because my wife uh, had our first baby and had to make some. Uh, for some medical reasons, we incurred some medical debt over the course of the year. Okay. Um, but from January to the end of last year, we managed to get all of that, you know, paid off or settled. Um, and then I think it was about, oh, I don't know, halfway through the year, we got into baby step three and have just kind of got stuck there where it feels like we accumulated we accumulated about half of our goal for the emergency fund mm-hmm. um and then it just feels like we've stalled out because and i feel i don't know if it's a budgeting problem i have but it just feels like every time so like every time a car breaks a little bit or some little thing comes up we're always dipping into the emergency fund and so i've just been getting frustrated because we haven't I thought we'd be closer and making more ground on the goal when it really just feels like we've been slipping for the past couple months. Yeah. And I'm trying to figure that out. (laughs) Can I ask a couple of background questions just to kind of get an idea? Um, How much debt did you guys pay off? So, um, like I said, it was kind of a mix of paying it off and also settling with the different medical establishments we had to work through. But we ended up getting rid of uh, about $8,000 in debt. Okay. And uh, because you told me that you've been kind of listening to this for five years and that you guys got debt free early on and then you had the. Yeah, we we didn't have any debt when we were married and we we bought two cars with cash in that time. Okay. And, you know, got our we did get our first house. Uh, That was the first debt we incurred as a couple was getting our mortgage. Okay. Um, What's your household income? Uh, It's about. We're kind of in between about, I think, forty and forty-five thousand each year. Um, I'm a I'm a contractor, single income household. My wife is stay at home. Okay, so what I want to encourage you is from this point on is really do these baby steps in order because I think you kind of got out of order. You guys did some of the debt, then you bought a house and then, you know, you kind of did your own thing. And I think that's why it's taking you a while. Now with this baby step three, it's going to take as long as you let it take, you know? And so the big key for this is a budget. And it kind of sounds like uh, you said that you're using a budget, but it doesn't sound like you guys are, are living, you know, swearing by this thing. It sounds like it's kind of there and maybe you follow it and maybe you don't. Am I, am I wrong or am I right? Um, a little bit of both. So one of the struggles for us is my, my income does like week to week 
fluctuates quite a bit being in contracting you know sometimes there's it feels like there's way more than enough on a week and then there's another you know week things come up kind of short so right we've uh and i don't know what the best practices are for budgeting on a on a you know an income that kind of fluctuates like that but well you want to you want to budget based on your your lowest possible month Right. So if you look back on the last six to eight months and you say, OK, like on average, this was this has been my lowest month, then I start the budget based on that and pay as much as you can. And then all the extra money, that money goes towards, you know, the gravy of the wants within the budget. So with a regular income, you would start with the most important things, your four walls, food, utility, housing, transportation. Then beyond right. that, if there's more money that month, we start moving down the list of things we got to take care of. You know, if you upgrade, you know, the baby needs some new clothes, whatever it is. And then at the very tail end is the luxuries. And you may not have room for those right now uh, with your income and where you guys are at. Mm -hmm. So how much money do you have in Baby Step 3 in that emergency fund right now? Um, As of right now, I think we have about, I think it's about 2800 right now. And what's your goal? started out, the goal is uh, 10000 Okay. Okay. Good goal. So we're we're about seven thousand dollars shy. And if you can you pick up extra work as a contractor? Um, I do a few side jobs uh, here and there. So I do most of my work exclusively through uh, through one guy. But I'm still considered independent. Um, but I do some side jobs on my own, and I am also a licensed barber. I barber on the side as a side hustle. Cool. And, and maybe there's um, something they, your wife can do too. Yeah, we, yeah, we've been trying to figure that. She does occasionally uh, do a little bit of substitute teaching. Here's um, the thing. Here's the thing. You guys, if, if you're wandering through this thing, it's going to take forever. And it kind of, I'm not trying to get on you, but it sounds like you guys are kind of like, oh, if it works, we'll do it. You know, if she feels like it, she'll do it. We try to go over here and do it. You've got to decide. And I know this is not baby step two, but baby step three is equally important because you have seen that if you don't have this baby step in order and you don't have this emergency fund there, what happens? You end up going back into debt. So you've got to get this done. And honestly, it's up to you guys how quickly you want to make this thing go. This can uh, span out another year and a year and a half, or you guys can knock this out in the next several months and have that uh, that $10,000 saved. So it's truly, truly, truly up to you, Britt. Yeah. All right, George. Oof. Well, I'm making, you know, that's about 20 bucks an hour if you're making mm-hmm. 40 grand a year. Yeah. And I'm going... He's a contractor. He's good with his hands. I'm going to go be a handyman on the side. Come and on. I know this because I pay these people. Yeah. You can charge 50 to 75 or more an hour as a handyman in your neighborhood. Yeah. My handyman said, I go to people's neighborhoods, some of these wealthy neighborhoods. I f- change out a light bulb and they're happy to have me there. Yeah. And you're, you're helping these people out. So get a post in a neighborhood <sighs> Facebook group and say, hey, I'm willing and able. Here's my rate. And do it. word of mouth happens, and all of a sudden, you just doubled your income. I just paid the man to come to the house and hang the TV on the wall. I couldn't believe how much it costs. All right, let, thanks for the call, Brett. Let's take another one. We got Gordon in Des Moines, Iowa. What's going on, Gordon? Hi, how are you guys doing today? We're doing great. How are you? Well, I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. It's another day with a brand new baby. So. Oh, oh, Ooh. you're in the throes. Okay, now I understand. How can we help? I mean, there's so much... <laughs> My guy is tired, George. He's tired. A little bit, but it's a happy tired. Good, so. good. Yeah. Um, so my question is actually quite similar to uh, to Brett, the last caller. He, um, I am a welder working full-time 40 hours a week. Um, and, well, at least. But I get paid weekly, and I'm trying to figure out how to do a monthly budget on a weekly paycheck. Um, and like in, in the every dollar app, I've separated, uh, separated it out into four paychecks. Um, and I don't know, it just, I, I can't quite figure it out there. And it seems like I'm losing, losing money somewhere. So I don't make me mad. <laughs> well, I, I got you. It can be frustrating. So you're using every dollar. Uh, do you have the, the premium version? Yes. Okay. So on the desktop, for sure, um, it should be on your mobile device too, but there's something in there called yeah. paycheck planning. And I think that's really going to be helpful for you because you're going to be able to space out and actually like 
plan out when you're going to use each piece of money that you've budgeted for. Does so that each make expense, sense? you'll mark the due date and it will show you in every dollar when you would run out of money so that you can adjust, move things around, change a due date on a bill and be proactive about that. Yeah, because when you're getting paid well, weekly, you've got to be smart about holding back some money, you know, and when it's time to pay. Otherwise, you're going to come up on moments where it's like, OK, like, why don't I have enough to pay my car note? What's going on here? So I would suggest using that paycheck planning feature. Uh, it's only a part of every dollar premium. So if you don't have premium and you're wondering, you're like, Jade, what the heck are you talking about? You got to have the premium version. And you can literally, like George said, plan out when you're going to spend each line item in your budget so that you don't have to worry about not having enough money when bills are due, not overdrafting, and having enough money to do the things that you need to do and that you'll want to do. This is The Ramsey Show. to the Ramsey Show. My name is Jade Warshaw. I am joined by my host, George Camel, and we are taking calls today about your life and your money. It's a free call. That's what Dave always says, although I don't think people pay for calls these days, George. It's 888 We might need to start charging, Jade, <laughs> if they start getting snappy with us. Junk fees. 888-825-5225 is the number. If you want to give us a call, we're talking about anything going on in your life, your money, you're having trouble budgeting, you don't think you need to have a zero credit score, you're trying to buy a house, I mean, you name it, we're going to talk about it today. So let's go to the phone lines. We got Andrew in San Francisco, California. What's going on, Andrew? Hey, Jay, and hey, George. I was just laughing. I hope you don't start charging for this call. Not this <laughs> the next call. You sound great. like a nice guy. Yeah, you're a good dude. <laughs> Anyways, I'm a big fan. I've been listening for a while, so thank you again for your time. Absolutely. Um, my, yeah, my, my question here, uh, my wife and I here... Um, we have no kids. We live in the Bay Area, and we all know how expensive it is here. And I, my, the big question that everyone asks me is like, how do we even begin to save for something like a home and um, and retirement in the next few years? Should we be thinking about moving moving out of California? Ultimately, um, yeah, I'm not going to give the details as we go forward, but that's that's the big question. Sure, that's a great question. Um, can I ask? Do you guys have any debt right now? Yeah, we do. Um, I can list them off for you. If that's the, does that work? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the big one is going to be our student loans. Um, it's roughly around 90 K. Okay. Uh, that's for both of us. Um, and we're both students right now. We're, we're both working, but both students as well. Are you and, currently um, paying cash for school or are you going into more student loan debt? I just got into student loan debt for my master's. Yeah. What's the master's in? Uh, it's a master's in design, uh, human computer interaction. So it'll be more than 90K when it's all said and done? No, no, it, that's it. That's, okay, that's okay. It, 90K okay. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. All right, keep going down oh, that yeah, line. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is probably, yeah, it's getting close. <laughs> Sorry. So 90K <laughs> for student loans and then uh, 6K for a car loan and then 6K for a credit card. Okay. Um, what's your income right now? I know you're both in school, but. Yeah, uh, so I'm working full time. We're both working full time and students full time. So um, I, I make around 130K. Uh, a year plus bonus, and she makes around 36k a year. What kind um, of bonuses do you make? Uh, I think I make around 10 to 12 percent on that a year. Okay. Um, and she, yeah, she's a caretaker, so I'm not sure there's bonuses there. She just started again, uh, but she's in school to be an RN. She has two years left, and I graduate this September. Cool. And you'll go straight to the workforce. Will you increase your income once you have that master's? Um, so the idea, well, I've been working uh, as a, in the industry for well, almost four years now, and I, I went back to school last year uh, to get my master's. And so um, I think 130K is a, yeah, it's a lot lower than probably Bay Area standards, but um, I'm looking to hopefully open my own thing because I do make, I have side, some side hustles as well. And your wife's, her income is going to go up, obviously, when she becomes a registered nurse. 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's the plan. I think it's you know it can be anywhere up from I don't know eighty to one hundred and twenty, whatever it is in the bay. Yeah. Right. I mean, you've got a lot of options. I think that if I were you, I would let this play out a little bit. Um, you've got okay. debt to pay off, and right now you've got the income to to make headway on that debt and start getting it paid off and walk through the baby steps. Now, when the time comes and you get to baby step 3B and you're saving for a down payment, life is going to look a lot different than it does now income wise and just the state of the world. We don't, you know, in the next two to three years, we don't know exactly what things are going to look like. But the good thing is this, the fields that you guys are in, you can do that anywhere. You don't have to be in the Bay area if you don't want to. And ultimately, you know, you're going to make those decisions based off of, where do we see ourselves? What's important? What's a priority to us? And, you know, I do think it's important to have home ownership in your future. Um, if you truly want to build wealth, I think that's a huge part of it. Um, and who knows with your income, the way it's going, it may be possible for you guys. You're going to have to buckle down, get out of this debt quickly and really Mm -hmm. uh, start working this plan so that when the time comes, you can afford these down payments, uh, so that you can buy real estate in that area. And if for some reason, you're not there yet. And you're like looking around the country and you're like, Hey, yeah. you know, <laughs> Iowa's looking pretty good right now. <laughs> you know, that's, it's your yeah. prerogative. You know, I, I think that there's something really freeing when you kind of allow yourself the ability to make the, the world in the United States, your oyster, you know, you don't have to stay in the Bay area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. These ultra high cost of living areas, you also need an ultra high income in order to survive there. Yeah. There's no rule that says if you make, you know, 20 grand a year, you get to live in Manhattan. And so the key yeah. for you guys is to understand it may feel like a long time, but six years ain't that long. And so if you guys start making yeah. 300 grand a year, which is very possible with where you guys are headed, mm-hmm. well, we're yeah. going to take a year and pay off the 100 grand of debt. We can do that making 300 grand. And now we freed up all those payments. We can save up over a hundred grand a year and throw it towards the down payment. And so now within five years, we have half a million dollars to put down on a million dollar condo. Who Mm -hmm. knows what it is in San Francisco. And now we have a $500,000 mortgage. We're making 300 grand and we're going to start attacking that house once we're investing. And so it's not that Mm -hmm. far. It's not a 20 year journey, but Mm -hmm. it's also not a two year journey. That's right. How old are you guys? And so map it out. Yeah. I'm sorry. How old are you guys? Uh, I turned 30 in August, and she's um, turning 29 in June. All right. Awesome. So we got some time here. We got some time to work this out. And George made a really good point. You know, six years, it all depends on how you, you know, how you view that. It's a, it's a long time, but it's not a long time. You know what I'm saying? Well, there's a lot of emotion wrapped up in that. Just, Jade, I mean, six years from now, who knows what inflation will do in the housing market. Yeah. But guess what? Six years is going to be here regardless. And so I'd rather be saving up a giant pile of money versus yeah. just complaining and not doing anything about it. Absolutely the case. And, you know, just to give people some some good feeling about this. You know, I think a lot of times we think about home ownership, starting a family, all of these things. And we feel like for some reason I had to have done this in my twenties. Mm, and if I didn't, late. if I didn't get married in my twenties, if I didn't have kids in my twenties, if I didn't buy a house in my twenties, if I didn't start investing in my twenties, then it's too late for you. And I'm like, George, if it was too late in the twenties, then I may as well give up on life because I didn't get started. Can I just tell you guys, Sam and I were married. We were married for 10 years. And then we decided to start a family. So number one, that's different because most people are popping out these babies early on. Oh yeah. Then we decided to uh, wait to buy a home because we needed to do things the right way. And then we had to wait to invest. We did not purchase our first home until age 35. Mm. We did not start investing until age 36. And your life isn't over somehow. My life is not over. You're Matter just getting of fact, started. I was looking at the the portfolio the other day and I said, this is not bad. Life's it, a lot better now than it was 10 years ago. Yes. 15 years ago. Yes. So the key is make progress. Make progress, not excuses. And don't let whatever somebody else is doing make you feel like you're behind because your life is your life. You run your race. Don't look to the right. Don't look to the left. You look straight ahead and run your race. Well, and you guys at are your doing left a great job. are your friends who are broke and they just look good. <laughs> and on the other side are your in-laws who are questioning why you don't give them grandkids yet and how you don't have a house because they paid eleven ninety nine on a bushel of raspberries for their house back in 1985. And it should be easy <laughs> for you too because they pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, Jade. What? And you need to do this. Uh, Listen, you've got to shut down all of that noise and put up the boundaries and you need to get laser focused on what your life is going to look like, what your race is going to look like. Because if we start chasing after other people's marathons, there is no finish line at the end. There's no We're finish line frustrated. at the end. 
There's no finish line at the end. And so you guys can do this. You can have the life that you want. You've just got to walk through the steps and do it the right way. Um, I know he's excited to get a house. There's a lot of other folks that are excited to get a house too, but you want to do it the right way. Okay. And, and it matters. So uh, let me see if I can get through this real quick. Uh, the truth is, if you're living a debt-free lifestyle, eventually you're not going to have a credit score. And we know that. And you're going to want to buy a house and you're going to want to find a good lender like Church Morga- Churchill Mortgage, who can help you do manual underwriting. That's where they personally review your financial history to approve you for a mortgage. So you don't need a credit score. So if you're interested in that, you can go to RamseySolutions.com slash agent. And that's what we're talking about, George, having the life we want doing it the right way. That's the theme this hour is rising above this broken system and realizing that not only is it better, but there's so much more joy and freedom and options on the other side. And you realize, oh, I don't miss my credit score. I don't miss my credit card rewards. I don't miss having to play this stupid game that has caused me to be broke. That's all it takes is you deciding and then being about the business of doing it. I'm not trying to play these games anymore, George. I want to do things. It's a rat maze. And you feel like you won because you get the cheese. But you're stuck (laughs) in a maze. And the cheese wasn't that good to begin with. Get out of the maze. All right. That does it for today's show. Be sure to join us next time. And remember, when it comes to changing your life and your money, yeah, you can tell me that you won't do it. But you better not tell me that you can't do it because I know for a fact all things are possible with God on your side. Hey, George Camel here. If you love the show and you want a deeper dive on your money journey, we've got a weekly newsletter that gives you helpful articles and tips on following the Ramsey way. Just go to RamseySolutions.com today to sign up for the newsletter. Again, that's RamseySolutions.com to sign up for our weekly newsletter. From the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the pods moving in storage studio, it's The Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work they love, and create actual amazing relationships. I'm your host today, Jade Warshaw. I'm joined by my favorite guy right here next to me on this show. George Campbell. I can't wait to tell Ken and John about that. It's shots fired. It's I went for it. going to hurt their feelings. They're well, so sensitive. You know, George, I say the same thing about them too, so there you go. I think. <laughs> the number is 888-825-5225. Give us a call. We'll chop it up with you. We got Brett on the line from Washington, D.C. What's going on, Brett? Hi there. Thanks for taking my call. I'm. My question today is, how do I draw boundaries when supporting a family member who's been charged with a crime and and likely facing um, incarceration. Mm. Sorry to hear that, Brett. How close is a family member? Uh, Immediate family member. Wow. Um, Who has a family and and kids. How many kids? Uh, Two. Are they pretty young? Mm Mm-hmm. And how likely is the incarceration? Um. It's, I, I, I think it's going to be likely. Okay. And do you know the length of time that it would be? Um, is this six months or 20 years? Uh, uh, it's in between there. Um, it's in the years. Um, okay. Um, I think probably five or longer. Okay. How so we're, you- we're talking about helping this family out for five to 10 years potentially. Yeah, I, I, I think so. It's, it's a little daunting um, at this point, right? Thinking about that. Yeah. How are you doing financially? Um, I, I'm lucky or we're, we're, we're doing well. And, and even in immediate terms, right? Like the most immediate things like retaining um, counsel and um, any bail um, uh, situations, like those things I've been able to, to cover and cash flow. Okay. Have you talked to this family yet? about what their needs are? Yes, uh, we've been um, actively supporting them, um, both kind of emotionally as well as even, you know, having them over and, and, and staying with us, right? Um, but I, we haven't gone too far. I think we're taking things one day at a time. Are they living with you right now? They will be. They will be. Is that long-term or is that a Temporary fix? Have you guys uh, talked about that? Temporary fix. There, there have been some discussions um, where I think good thing is there is 
there is family on both sides who can be supportive. Um, I, I think the details are not quite there, right, in terms of um, who all is going to chip in, how much, things like that. I, it's just, I just imagine there's going to be a component that, of support. It's going to yeah. be a village, yeah. Here's the two things that come to my mind, if I'm being honest. Um, I'm trying to put myself in your shoes as best as possible. And the two things that are coming to mind are how you're feeling or how I might feel when something kind of gets dropped in in your lap. And it's not because of anything you did. It's not anything that, you know, it just is set in your lap and it's like, all right, I got to react to this. And you've done a great job handling bail, stepping in and, and cash flowing this. And my first thought is make sure you take care of yourself mentally because you don't want to start feeling um, any bitterness or spite Mm -hmm. or like, oh, like, I can't believe I have to do this, this guy. You know, I don't know the nature of what took place. It doesn't matter. But all I know is you're on the hook for it and you feel on the hook for it. Um, So there's a piece, there's a component there that I'm thinking about. Um, And then on the financial side, you know, you said you guys are doing well financially. You don't have any debt, correct? Um, that's right. Just a mortgage. Just a mortgage. Um, and it sounds like, you know, within your day to day cash flow, within your budget, you've got money that you can put to put towards this. But it doesn't mean mm-hmm. that you have to. Um, and so I kind of want to give you permission to say no sometimes. Now, if you want to be generous and you want to participate, um, I think that's great. But I also want to say very loud and clear, you're not required um, to do anything here, except, you know, you can provide counsel, but you're not required to do anything monetarily. Um, And I think starting there is a great way to start. And then you can decide what you would like to do. Does that make sense? That does. That does. So how much are you thinking about, let's say, if there was a, a monthly contribution limit? I almost look at this like a mission organization that I want to support, mm-hmm. and me and my wife have a conversation about what we're both okay with contributing, uh, maybe, and we do it in year chunks. And we say, we're going to commit to one year, we're going to mm-hmm. give you $200 a month, every month, for this year. Mm-hmm. Have you had that kind of conversation with your spouse? Not yet. Um, not yet. I think having all of that real clear up front yeah. helps because a lot of people, what creates the the toxicity in these relationships and the resentment is when the expectations weren't set, they weren't communicated, mm-hmm. and now we're going, well, no, I, I thought this money was forever, and I thought it was just however much we need whenever we want right. versus saying, hey, we're happy mm-hmm. to give. Here's how much we're able to give right now. Uh, that could change in the future. It could go up. It could go down based on where we're at financially and what we can do. And I think if everyone in the conversation in this village has that conversation with each other and as a group, you're going to have a lot clearer boundaries as to what this looks like going forward. Absolutely. And there's another component about that too, uh, George, that you made me think about. Um, I know a lot of times with churches, when they do benevolence or do do things to help out in the community, they don't just give monetary amounts to folks you know folks come to the doors and it's like hey you know single mom i'm suffering with this or i'm having a hard time paying the mortgage they don't just give them you know seven eight hundred dollars they go and pay the mortgage Mm -hmm. they go right in and pay the light bill so i kind of want to advise you in that way not to just hand out money and not to hand out cash but actually go in and do those items like if it's if it's for rent you pay the rent if it's for lights you pay the actual light bill that way it's just another way to make sure that you're feeling good and that you have some bit of control uh, over how this money that you're generously giving it's okay for you to have control over how it's spent and sometimes the best thing we can do is not just to give a pile of money every month, but to actually empower the person to change their life and take control of it. Mm-hmm. And so the spouse that's the now taking care of these kids on their own, are they able to work and are you able to support them in that way to get them on their feet to where they can provide for themselves? Yeah. Um, I think I can provide some coaching. It, it is a tough situation. Um, this spouse um, it has been a stay-at-home mom. Um and it's been a long time since mm-hmm. she's been in the workforce. Well, um, here's what I want to do. I want to gift you with Financial Peace University, and I want you to gift that to the, the wife so that she can 
figure out you know, what her footing is moving forward. She's gonna learn all the principles of money. She's gonna learn how to pay off debt. She's gonna learn how to save. She's gonna learn how to do all of those necessary things that are gonna be really important for her uh, going forward. So hang on the line and Austin will get that for you guys. I'm gonna add in one more thing. Dr. John Deloney's book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future. Cause there's a lot of trauma in the situation yep. on a lot of things we gotta learn how to move forward with. That's right. Great, great call. Thank you so much for that call. Hopefully we were able to help you out. This is The Ramsey Show. to The Ramsey Show. My name is Jade. This is George sitting next to me and we're taking calls about your life, your money, your financial situation. What's bothering you in the world as it relates to finance? What is a problem for you in the world as it relates to finance? Your life, your money. Give us a call. 888-825-5225. Now, here you go. For those of you out here listening um, that don't know my personal story, let me tell you a little something. My husband and I paid off four hundred and sixty thousand dollars of debt now i don't know where y'all come from but where i come from that's suspiciously close to half a million dollars george all right when we did this we paid it off guys working the baby steps we talk about this every day on the show uh the same baby steps that we teach in financial peace university now financial peace university it's a nine-week class that shows you how to beat debt and here's the thing and build wealth What we're talking about on this show, the baby steps, it's not just about debt free, debt free, debt free, debt free. We're trying to build wealth up in here, George. It's so that. It's so that. that. So that you live like no one else so later you can live and give like no one else. And let me tell you guys, I believe in this class, Financial Peace University, so much uh, that I help lead classes. I'm leading an FPU class right now. As a matter of fact, we started last night. It's going amazing. And I'm leading classes because this changes lives. It changes lives. It's doing it all over the world. And um, I'm telling you, there's nothing special about me, though. All right. I'm just like you, just like all y'all listening out here. So leading an FPU class isn't just for those people. It's not just for Jade or, or George or Dave. It's for you, too. You can actually start helping folks. Now, it might seem scary to lead a class, but you need to do it anyway. And I'm telling you right now, it's not scary. They tell you exactly what to do, exactly what to say, because there are people out there now. You feel scared. They, they feel scared and they need you. They're scared to open their bills every month. They're scared to check their bank account and they need you because because you guys know how to do this and you can. I'm telling you to be a coordinator, it's so easy. You just follow the plan. They tell you exactly what to say so you guys can do this. You so, don't have to be debt free and a millionaire to lead a class. You just have to be yes. passionate and believe in what we teach and that's most of you listening out there. That is such a good point, George. I think a lot of people think, well, if I'm in baby step 2, who am I to teach this stuff? You're even even better. Even better, because that means you're right there with them. You're walking along with them. And not only is it going to be encouraging to them, it's also going to be encouraging to you as well on your journey. Uh, So right now, I want you to go online. I want you to type in RamseySolutions.com slash lead to learn more about becoming an FPU. That's Financial Peace University Coordinator. Go to RamseySolutions.com slash lead lead. Super important stuff, George. Love it. All right, let's take a call. We got Nathan in Sarasota, Florida. What's going on, Nate Dog? Hey, how are you guys today? I'm doing good. Sorry about the Nate Dog. I are you it... okay with Nate Dog? Uh, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> he is now. Sometimes I, I can't resist. Sorry about that, Nathan. What you got going on? So I'm 20 and I'm been living on my own since I was 18 and I'm things are getting pretty serious me and my girlfriend mm. and I'm just curious on potentially we want to get married in the next three years and I'm just wondering if it's a bad idea to rent if we're not ready to buy a house or should we wait where'd you get the idea that it was a bad idea to rent um I mean my parents. <laughs> Aha. 
There it is. I figured that much. And they're saying, hey, wh- Nathan, why would you throw money away on rent when you can get into a house and start building equity? Is that the, basically what they're saying? Pretty, pretty on there. Okay. Well, I'll tell you this much. We never recommend someone buy a house before they're ready. And we also recommend that newlyweds rent for a while before they buy a house. Because you got enough going on with the stress of a wedding. I mean, it is like a, it's like being in a car crash. It can be traumatic. Just so much stress <laughs> compacted for this one big party we're throwing everyone. And then you're also going, oh, that's your side of the, that's my side of the, no, we got, we got issues here. And so you're already trying to navigate right. newlywed life on top of home ownership. Mm. That's just a lot at once, emotionally, mentally, financially. Mm. And so there is nothing wrong with renting. And I want to be here to dispel the myth that renting is a sin and tell you that renting is a great thing to do and it gives you such flexibility. And when something goes wrong, you call someone to come fix it while you guys sit there and eat ice cream and be cute newlyweds. I know, that's right. I like that, George. So that's the plan. Are you guys have any debt currently? Um, She doesn't. She actually um, got scholarships all through. She um, is about to graduate um, state college here in the next two months. This is a green flag for this relationship, Nathan. I'm liking this already. You don't have any debt, right? No, ma'am, I don't. Mm. I didn't go to school, and um, Sweet. I've just kind of – it's kind of been – I never really like – I don't like owing people money. I hate it mm-hmm. as it is. That's always how I've been myself. So I never told my mom I never want to go to college, so I got into a trade, and I've been plumbing for two years now, and it's yeah. been actually Way working great. So, so let's just walk this through. Let's say you guys – you get married. We're going to cash flow the wedding. We're going to save up for the engagement ring. So you already have some financial goals ahead of you. Yes, sir. And so if we can start our marriage off completely debt-free with a cash flowed wedding and have a fully funded emergency fund, Mm -hmm. that is a win in my book as far as starting a marriage off on the right foot. And just to be clear, you're doing these things separate of one another on your own. So you're saving up your nest egg for the wedding. She's saving up her nest egg for the wedding. And you're saving up money, your nest egg for, you know, three to six months of savings. She's saving up her nest egg. And then when you get together, uh, you can go ahead and combine those finances. Does that sound good to you, Nathan? Yes. Yes, Awesome. Awesome. You know, it's really funny, George. Uh, I read a stat that said only 43% of couples combine their finances. Yikes. Married couples. So we're we're talking about 57% of people go, "Uh uh-uh, that's my money. Well, it's crazy. Yeah. (laughs) That's such a crazy thought to me. It's nuts. That you'll you'll share spit and a bed and DNA, but you can't share a bank account. (laughs) It's different. What is wrong with you people? Well, it's even crazier because here's the thing. These are real studies that show uh, married couples that combine their money. They build wealth four times faster uh, because they're more likely to purchase a home together. They're more likely to stay together over the long haul of their marriage. And it literally said this. They are happier. I believe that. They're happier. Well, think about it. You got a closed fist you're living your life with where you're going, this is my money and that's your money and you spend what you want to spend. I'll spend what I want to spend. You don't get to tell me how I spend my money. And you have those kind of control issues. You're not, you're not going to get very far. But no. when you live life with an open hand going, this is our money and our life. What could we do together? You will go so much further together. So much further. It's it's just unbelievable to me. I, I, I don't get it. Maybe we have time to take a quick call. Let's make this one fast. We got Daniel. Get to it fast. We're up against the clock. Hello. Um, I was calling in because I'm curious if I should invest in a Roth IRA because I'm, I'm 16 and I just started a job at a Subway working on the weekends. Uh-huh. I was wondering if it's too early to invest in a Roth or if I should start like doing like the nest egg baby steps because like my parents are really good. I have a place to live. They they like help me with like food and like grow. They help me with like food and uh so you have no debt, stuff. nothing like I that? I don't have any debt. I don't have any, like, need to spend money, really. It's only, like, stuff that I want that I'm sure. spending you have money a on. Car? I wondering if, uh, no, I actually live close enough to my work to bike there. Cool. I haven't gotten wow. the car yet. Okay. Well, I love the idea of investing. I just want to make sure that our upcoming financial goals, for example, you know, higher education, do you plan on going to school? To college? Uh, I'm planning on doing, I'm actually planning on doing certifications for IT. Because I want to work in IT, and from what I've read, college isn't really the best way to get into IT. It's certifications. Way like, to go, man. Like go CCNA. 
Well, I'd make sure we can cash like flow that. a car purchase because you're going to need that sooner rather than later. Make sure we can cash flow the certification. So I might just be saving all this money in a high yield savings account right now because we the next few years, there's a lot of financial goals that we might have to hit. But if you can do that and have an emergency fund and you get out on your own, you're going to be investing in no time. I mean, the fact you're even talking about this, you're going to be a multimillionaire probably <laughs> in your 40s at this point. And so uh, I love the idea of investing, but I might pause until... I have a full-time job. I love that. There's a right way and and there's a best way to do this. I like to say it like that. There's a best way uh, to do this and make sure your education's there and make sure your your investments are there. We want to do it in the right order. So I just like that he's thinking about it. I was a knucklehead at 16. I still am. This kid's sharp. (laughs) I I love it. We love to see it. We love when the young folks call in the show. Uh, This is The Ramsey Show. listening to The Ramsey Show. My name is Jade Warshaw. This is George Campbell. And uh, George, you showed me something really crazy. I found a tweet. Now, there's a lot of tweets that make me angry, and there's a lot of tweets that make me laugh. This one somehow did both. And so I wanted to (laughs) share it with you, Jade, and all of our listeners out there and get your take on it. Oh, gosh. So, uh, boys, throw up that tweet. So this is a tweet from someone that says... (laughs) Finally paid off my vodka crayon from last month. God is good with a little praise emoji. And it's a receipt from Afterpay. They put a $12 cocktail on payments. Four easy payments on a $12 cocktail. No, no, no. And not God is good. (laughs) Don't throw God. He he had nothing to do with it. This is your stupidity. Oh, Lord. Don't blame him. Don't thank him. This is crazy. And, And it's Afterpay? I, I could tell it's Afterpay based on the logo. I know these scumburgers. I, I, I'm i shook. So this is, if you all don't know, the, this is the b- new thing that Gen Z's into, which is buy now, pay later. So they're anti-credit cards, but they're pro-payments because they're going, well, there's no interest, so how bad can it be? It's bad. Payments on a drink? Because think about it. That's one interaction. That's one time going out. You keep adding that to your tab with your payments, and all of a sudden you go, okay, well, I only spent 25% of what I would have spent, which leaves room in my budget so that I can pay after pay the next month and the next month and the next month. Let me. This is insane. If you, I'm just going to say, if you have to put a $12 drink on payments, you are a hot flame of a flame of a mess. You're just a hot, flaming, oh my funky goodness. mess. It's it's gotten real bad out there, Jade. Gosh. And uh, these companies, you've heard of them. Afterpay. Here's their tagline: Get what you want. We've got your back. Okay, that's that's a great way to create an entire generation that's broke. Wow. Here's a firm's: Pay at your own pace. That's what. Hey, hey, pay at your own pace. No rush. We're happy to wait. We'll take wow. another payment next month. And then Klarna is my favorite: Get financial breathing room. Because nothing says breathing room. Like being chained to like payments. Like What? Oh, my goodness. Oh, and wow. here's what gets me. Klarna also brags to the retailers that use this program that the consumer will spend up to 45% more if you have Klarna as an option. They know what they're doing. Well, duh. That's why they make billions of dollars and you remain broke. But instead, you go, no, Jade, it's smart. I'm, I'm leaving room in my budget, Jade. What do you mean? I, I can't even breathe right now, George. I can't even breathe you, right now. You need now. to use Klarna because they'll give you some breathing ooh, room, apparently. Oh, okay. And they'll give me a drink while I'm at it. Vodka Cran. Look, I read a stat that said 57% of people who use buy now, pay later regretted their purchase. Buy now, regret later. That's the new I name. I love that. I know How about just right. buy now, pay now? That feels like the way God and grandma would do it. Hot diggity dog. want to bring God into this. Yeah. It's insane to me. What if you just popped out a $10 bill in a single two singles and just pay for that $12 drink. Like, I mean, blowing my mind. Oh God. Just make your drinks at home, people. You know, <sighs> do it like we do on Smart Money Happy Hour. Okay, we're on a budget out here. We're not going to these crazy <laughs> cocktail bars. And wow. by the way, it's just, wa- it's all watered down. It tastes gross. Yeah, 
Exactly. I'm just done going out. I'm too. I'm like an old curmudgeon of a man, Jade. Look, you're telling Nashville me Nashville cocktails are now twenty bucks, and they have a liquor tax of an extra fifteen percent on top of the ten percent in Nashville. And I'm like, I'm just done. You know, I'm going to the crib. I'm going to the crib. I'm gonna pour my Eagle Rare in my Whoa. in my in my glass with my square cube. Because I'm not going to one of these restaurants. Trust and believe, I'm not going to Applebee's getting an old fashioned where there's like 0.00% of no drink in the drink. You know what I'm saying? I'll stick to my water. All That's right. what I eat when I, when I go out. I get water because I'm too cheap. And I have money. I just, I'm like, this ain't worth it. It's not worth it. I'm not it. paying the premiums. It never, well, and I'm not paying in four payments. <laughs> exactly. Goodness. George, I, okay. All right. Now I'm, that we're riled up. I'm glad we got this out of our system. So we have to talk about something, Jade. We get calls on occasion on the show uh, from folks that have disabilities. Yes. They're they're blind. They're deaf. Um, a lot of these people, you know, have had these a long time since they were young. Yeah. And because of that, they're on disability income. Yes. SSDI. And the problem with that is that the government limits you to how much money you have to your name. And the limit is very, very low. $2,000 total. At any given moment is the limit you, to, be, to, to remain eligible for your benefits. That's poverty. I mean, that's unbelievable, George. Yeah, it's really sad. All right. So what are the options here? Because we get people calling in and it's like, hey, I want to I work the baby steps. I want to do things to get my income up. But if I get my income up too high, then I don't get this benefit. But they're also afraid to lose the benefit because then they they're responsible for their life, their insurance. All of those things. So it is, it is a very precarious situation. Yeah. So here's, here's one option. Either you've got to learn how to, on how to live your life with that low disability income due to how extreme the disability is, or a better option, if you're able to, based on the nature of your disability, if you can do some type of work, yes. you will be way better off financially because you're not stuck under these insanely rigid rules for your, your income and your assets. Absolutely. I mean... Uh, I want to make it very clear. If you are on this disability, we're not mad at you. Like we, we're not saying, hey, if you're taking this money, you know, you're wrong or there's something wrong with you. No, not at all. It, we're just letting you see that this is the choice that you have to make. And I, I'll be honest, when I look at $2,000, it's very, I'm like, how? And within, with everything going on, that is, that's more scary to me than, going out because I feel like with the internet there's a lot of ways that some some of these folks might be able to get get above that and they'd be surprised what they can do because you've got something to offer absolutely you've got there's something that you're good at there's some service that you have to offer um and you can make there's so many ways you can make money today George yes and so there is an option for those with disabilities to where they can have more than two thousand dollars and it, it's it's not illegal. It's called an Great. ABLE account. And it's basically a savings account where you can have up to $100,000 without affecting your disability income. And what's cool is that family members can gift money into this. Love this. So it is a good option for those. And some people don't know about it. And we've got some emails coming in from people that go, hey, I just heard this call from this person with disability. You got to let them know about the ABLE account. So this is a tax advantage savings account for those with disabilities and their families. There are some restrictions as to who's eligible for this. Yeah. So you have to have been diagnosed with your disability before the age of 26. Yep. So if that's you, uh, you most likely are eligible for this. And what makes me sad, this is straight from, from one of the ABLE sites. It says to remain eligible for these public benefits, an individual must remain poor. Oh. That is the most frustrating sentence I've heard in a long, long time. Well, I, I think it's it's just frustrating. It's like you're helping, but you're also hurting because r the real help would be like, can it can it be enough to live on? Because that's barely enough. Now, I th I'm thankful for this ABLE deal because you can add money to that. But, you know, again, the but choice we're, we're is yours. we're all about helping you build wealth yeah. and be generous and have control over your yeah. finances. And it's really hard to prosper when you have limited income and limited ability to save. And the government is ensuring that you are their slave yeah, at this point with this program. I kind of feel like they're selling these folks short. Because they're, they're scared to let go of it, Jade. It, it, well, they're getting into these, they're getting into some of these folks' head and making them think, I need this and I, I, I can't go beyond this. And now for some people listening, that may be the best choice for you. You know, sticking on the 2000, getting connected with Able. But for some of these people listening, 
I think that we just need to infuse hope and and let you know, hey, you've got something to offer. There are opportunities out there for you. And I think that you can make more than 2000. Absolutely. I, I and it wouldn't take a, much to, to hit yeah. that threshold. And here's the thing with the ABLE accounts that I want you all to know about. People with disabilities and family members can deposit up to $17,000 in an ABLE account for 2023. So that is the limit for this year. You might be able to contribute more money if you have a job and you're able to work. You can do an additional $13,590 if you're in the U.S. continentally. So Very there cool. are options out there. I want to make sure those that are out there with disabilities and if you've got a loved one in your life, please send them this information. We want to help everyone. This is a show and the content is for everyone in all yep. walks of life. And yes, it's harder if you've got a disability. 100%. I don't want to minimize that. But I also want to encourage you guys that you have so much to offer and that this doesn't have to hold you back. This could be a part of your story that inspires others along the journey and you can still build wealth, but you've got to make this happen on your terms, and not the government. If you're doing that, call in and tell us about it. We'd love to hear. I want you. you to call in and I want you to tell us what you're doing. It's going to encourage somebody else to do the same thing. This is The Ramsey Show. to the Ramsey Show. My name is Jade Warshaw. Next to me, to my right, my right-hand man, George Camel. And we've got a scripture and quote of the day for you. It's this. It says, be kind to one another, be compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. That's Ephesians 4.32. And Kenny Loggins said this, the more we stretch the muscle called compassion and generosity, the stronger we get. The better we feel about ourselves, the more loving we become to the world around us. Oh, beautiful words from one of my favorite artists, Kenny Loggins. I mean, <laughs> the hits go on, Jade Footloose, Danger Zone, this is it. Can't wait for his upcoming concert. But which of us is going to that concert, you. George? That's right. That's right. I'm coming to that concert. He's Got 75 years old. The man's still out there doing he, the thing. He can sing higher and better than ever. I'm just letting you know. That means Dave's got no excuse. He better be behind this chair at 75, <laughs> still crushing the game. <laughs> he will be. Don't you worry about that. Give us a call. The number is 888-825-5225. We'll take your call. We got Harry in Salt Lake City. What's going on, Harry? Not a whole lot, Jay and George. Thanks for taking my call. Of course. So my question today, my wife and I were, um, we paid off about $15,000 in debt. And uh, we just have two debts left. We have a personal loan and student loans. Uh, the personal loan is about 7000 left, and student loans is 29000 Um okay. With the pause on the student loan payments, should we make any payments to that at all, or should we just continue to stay focused on that personal loan? Yeah, I think that's a temptation that a lot of people are feeling right now to kind of – you know, loop it out of order. Now, I do have one question. The student loan, mm -hmm. is it just one student loan for 29000 or is it broken up into pieces? It's all consolidated in 29000 Yeah. Well, you know what? I'm going to tell you to go ahead and just work the debt snowball in order. I think that's the best way mm -hmm. to do it because you're going to you're going to feel those wins and that you need mm -hmm. that to keep going. You're going to uh, how fast can you knock out this next seven thousand? Uh, my wife and I have panned it out. Um, we, we make about 100000 uh, as a household, and within the next four months, we'll have it paid off. Oh, awesome. Yeah. But you're saying, hey, the student loans are paused completely. Should I even make minimum payments on those? Because we yeah. say debt snowball, make minimum payments on all your debts except the first one. You're saying, should I pay a dime towards these while yeah. I attack it? That's a good call out, George. Yeah, make minimum payments. Make minimum payments. Okay. That's the way the snowball works. The snowball works is you make minimum payments on all the debt and put any extra money on the smallest debt. And that way, when it's unpaused, 
you've already been flexing that muscle, making that payment, plus mm-hmm. the extras going towards the debt. And so when that gets unpaused, and it eventually will, as much as they keep kicking it down the road, man, you're going to be in control. I agree. And so man, I'm, I'm <laughs> pumped for you that you're like, I want to attack all of this debt. I just want to know the best way to do it instead of waiting on someone else to fix it all. Heck yeah. That's exciting. Absolutely. I can't wait for you guys. Woo. When's the, when's the debt free, when's debt free day? Debt free day. Uh, we're still trying to figure that out. We're, we're hoping maybe in the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Well, that is super. Yeah, making 100 grand, paying off, what, 36? Heck That's yeah. That's feasible. That is exciting. Exciting stuff. Thanks for the call, Harry. Let's see what Jay's talking about in New York City. What's going on, Jay? Hey, thanks for taking my call. No problem. So I'm, actually, I'm actually a police officer in New York. I have four years on the job, and I have 16 years left until I am eligible to retire. I'm 35 years old. Um, currently I have about 40 K in deferred, I mean, traditional retirement, um, offered through my employer and they just now gave us the opportunity to switch over to a, uh, a Roth option. Okay. And I was wondering if I should make that move or not. Great question. So you're 35. You said you've got 15 years until you can retire. 16? Uh, one, six, six, 16 years until I'm eligible to retire. And at that point, I'll be able to leave making 50% of my salary, which should keep me at around $100,000 a year. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah, I wouldn't touch the current investments, but if you want to start contributing to the Roth side for future investing, I think that's a great move at your age. Okay. So, yeah, because currently I'm already contributing 20% to the traditional you think i should just go all in and stop doing the and go straight to 20 percent to the raw i would go 15 percent until you have a paid for house do you have a paid for house nope i am completely debt free um i moved back at home with my parents because i'm single and i figured you know what they're going to be moving to florida in a few years so i'm going to hang out until until they move along and uh, maybe purchase their house that's a cool goal so if you go down to 15%, I would use that 5% you now have back in your life to begin saving towards that future house purchase, whether it's in okay. the next five years, the next 15 years. And the the idea here with the Roth is that you're using your after-tax dollars, but then the money's going to grow tax-free. And so either way, if you crunch the numbers, it would be the same. So what we're actually talking about here is what your tax bracket will be when you're older. And we're basically saying we think taxes will go up over the course of history. And so therefore having tax-free money is going to be better. And so there's a, it's a hot debate in the, among the finance nerds out there, but I personally would rather have that tax-free money uh, with no required minimum distributions because uncle Sam's already got his cut. And so I like that plan. And if I have $2 million in a Roth 401k, I have $2 million to my name that I can do what I want with without paying taxes. And that's just a good feeling. Uh, I like that. Does that answer your question, Jay? Yeah, absolutely. That's huge. Yeah, way to go. And, th- and thank you for your service. I mean, Very being cool. a police officer in New York, that's serious business. Oh, yeah, I know. That's right. I'm thinking about the fact that he's moving into his parents' house and thinking about buying his parents' house. I was like, that's, that's, that's a different move. You got to have some type of great relationship with your family to do that. Yeah, I don't know if I could do that. I, I, I love my parents. I Caveat. Lo- I love my parents, but... oh. It, it can't happen. Let me just put it like that. It cannot happen. Oh, my goodness gracious. So we've got every once in a while we get questions on social media. And I've got here one. I've got one here from a, a dude in Georgia. His name is Evan. And he says, my wife and I have twenty three thousand two hundred fifty dollars in debt and two credit cards and a vehicle. I work two jobs and she works one. We have a newborn and are currently renting. We have 12K in savings and I have paused my retirement of 10%. The question is, should we use any of our savings toward the debt? Oh, this feels like one of those riddles that you, you know, in in math class. (laughs) Like a train is moving from Georgia at 48 miles an hour. Okay. (laughs) So the crux of the question is, I've got 12,000 in debt. I'm trying to work the Ramsey plan. Yeah. He's paused retirement, which is an awesome step. Great. Because you just have freed a hard time up money. With that. Yeah. And you're going, do I let go of the savings? Which is such an emotional decision for most people. They yeah. cannot fathom the idea of going down to $1,000, which is what we recommend. I mean, yeah, I get it. They, it's, it's like a, a safety net. It's a, it's a, a blankie, if you will. You know, my son. I like that. It's a blankie. 
My son has this blanket. It's old and torn up, and he's had it since the day he's born. And he, I mean. If I went up to him and I took that blanket. Oh, oh, you're going to catch an eye jammy. Oh, yeah, he's catch some hands. Yeah, he's gonna, you're going to catch some hands. Oh, my goodness. So, yes, I would use 11000 of your 12000 in savings to go towards your 23000 in debt. And maybe that vehicle gets sold if you want to speed up this process and get that savings account back up faster. And so depending on what the car is worth, you know, if you if you owe 10 on the car and you can sell it for 12 or 15 or whatever yeah. it is, and you get yourself a beater car for a little while until you get back up to baby step three, then uh, I think that could be a good move for you. I like it. You know, the the theme that we keep coming across as we take these calls, especially the calls that are kind of related to the baby steps and doing the baby steps in order, discomfort is required. Mm. It's required. You can't get around it. And I think what gets people kind of going off track and it's like, oh, I don't know if I want to touch the savings to pay off the debt. I don't know if I want to stop my retirement contribution to pay off the debt. It's that comfort valve. People think, oh, I don't want to get discomfort. I don't want to get out, you know, and you have to, you have to embrace discomfort to do this process. And we're just, we're humans. And so we are creatures of habit. And so yeah. anything that's changed is difficult. So the day you go, all right, am I going to submit myself to someone else's plan or am I going to be a financial genius who's broke? Those are your <laughs> options. And it's hard to go like, I don't know if that, oh, that plan, my situation's different. I'm unique. The day you realize you're not that special okay. is the day you can start winning with money. Okay. Everybody thinks they're the exception to the plan. Oh, but George, because the way my income is set up. Oh, but George, we have a regular income. Oh, but George, we have six kids and, and, a, and a van. Get that butt out of here. No butts around here. Okay. Okay. You ain't special. You ain't special. And that's special. a good thing. It means you can change <laughs> your life just like everyone else. That's right. And that does it for this episode hour. Be sure to join us next time. And remember this, when it comes to changing your life and money, you can tell me you won't do it, but please don't tell me you can't. With God, all things are possible. Hey, what's up guys? It's Jade. Look, if you like what you heard in this episode and want to know more about getting started on the Ramsey baby steps, go to RamseySolutions.com and click the get started button. We'll help you figure out the best next step for you based on your specific situation. That's RamseySolutions.com and click get started.